Thank you, Michael. So as Michael has mentioned, the Australian Export Grains Innovation Centre, which is based in Western Australia and New South Wales, with headquarters in Perth and Sydney, a small team of business and agricultural economic analysts have undertaken a series of studies of our Australian grain competitors. And all these reports, and each is over 100 pages, are available on the AGIC website. And these mostly have not been desktop studies, but have involved us visiting each of these countries and literally walking through their supply chains from farm visits right through to port terminals, talking to shipping agents, talking to their grain handlers, talking to their transport, talking to government officials. So it's been a very detailed exposition of the nature of their grain production systems. And what I'm here to do is really to talk you through what are we observing to be the ramifications of the grain production prowess of these nations. And not only have we looked at overseas grains competition, but we've also looked within Australia and we've done a series of reports. The last one came out towards the end of last year, which is a very detailed study of the nature and cost of the components of the grain supply chains in every region of Australia. So I'm drawing on that suite of analyses. And not only that, but we also have undertaken a, a series of blog articles and we've had some guest bloggers. So I welcome you to, at your leisure, go and visit the blog site and have a, a read of some of the either guest blogs or blogs that we've written. So what are all these reports and analyses telling us? Well, this is probably the, the summary chart, and I'm going to talk about this in some detail. So this is a chart that looks at the shares of export grain sales by leading export nations from the early 2000s right through until the most recent year. And what I want to show you is that there are a few countries that have very rapidly emerged to become major sources of grain exports. The red circled far right grey line is Brazil. So Brazil's international share of the grain market trade has gone from about 8% at the start of the 2000s to now almost a quarter of all the international grain trade is coming out of Brazil. The other circled lines are Ukraine and Russia. In the 1990s, Ukraine and Russia were at times actually grain importers. And it's over the last two decades that those two countries, and, and often you'll hear the term Black Sea region, which is Russia, Ukraine and Kazakhstan, that Black Sea region has emerged from virtual obscurity almost absent from international grain trade to being now the suppliers of over 20% of the international grain trade. You can contrast that to Australia, that Australia at the start of the 2000s was about the fourth or fifth most important supplier of internationally traded grain globally. In that suite of seven 
countries or regions, we are now on the lowest rung. So we have dropped into the most minor of placings among that group of major international grain exporters. And when you have a look at wheat, which is by far the dominant grain produced and exported in Australia, this is a chart that plots the shares of the international grain trade in wheat by country, by region. And what, again, is interesting to note is that you've had, um, sorry, you've had regions like the European Union, which has roughly maintained its market share. By contrast, the United States of America has had a huge erosion in its market share. Russia, two years ago, became the world's largest exporter of wheat globally. So they've gone from virtually being absent to now being the world's main source of export surplus wheat. Similarly, Ukraine has rapidly emerged. When we were in Ukraine, I visited the farm of Lawrence Richmond, who used to be several years ago Victoria's largest wheat producer. He now co-owns and manages wheat, corn, sunflower farms in southern Ukraine and Romania. And I had access to all his cost of production data and it's no surprise that Ukraine has emerged as a, a major source of internationally traded wheat. So you've had the rise of Russia and even in prospect, Russia remains a key source of competition. The wheat crop that is forecast to be harvested in 2019 is going to be around about 76 million tonnes, which will be Russia's second largest wheat harvest ever. They've further increased the area that they're planting to wheat. And remember their wheat is a largely a winter wheat which is much higher yielding than spring wheats. When we were in Argentina, uh, here's a, a chart of the trajectory of wheat yields in Argentina that's shown by the upper orange line. Australia is the lower blue line. Again, the story there is that there is a growing divergence between the wheat yields being achieved in Argentina versus those being achieved in Australia. On the left, there is an example of a self-propelled uh, uh, crop sprayer produced in Argentina. One of the competitive strengths of Argentina is that it has a state-of-the-art machinery manufacturing sector, unlike Australia. Uh, one example there, of their booms is that uh, a company in Argentina that used to make carbon fibre yacht masks thought that if they could build a structure vertically, they could also do that horizontally. So they've moved into carbon fibre boom spray arms. Uh, they have state-of-the-art engineering. They, with their depreciated peso, are able to sell and export their machinery and further support their local grain sector. Um, Western Australian farmers, late last year, when I explained to them the nature and cost of some of this machinery, and they were doing their sums, they realised that they could save $150,000 in capital purchases purely by switching the manufacturer of their self-propelled headers and their spray gear. You know, similarly, in Argentina, it's a, a story that's emerged that their grain 
production systems are being underpinned by massive foreign investments. Uh, to give you an example, as of December last year, so literally just over a month ago, they had received 107 brand new locomotives, 3,500 rail cars. The source of this investment are Chinese rail company manufacturers. They have already upgraded 580 kilometres of their northern Belgrano rail system. Uh, it's a $2.8 billion investment. So when you think of how difficult is the struggle in Australia to get local, let alone government investment in rail and road infrastructure, and yet you've got a competitor that, and this is only the start of the investment, uh, um, developing new infrastructure. The world's largest grain port terminal is under construction just north of Rosario. So this is an example. The, the picture on the left is traditional grain transport. So you have small trucks that carry normally about 30 tonnes and they're literally lifted up in the air and, and emptied and they are millions of truck journeys. Those trucks are gradually increasing in size with investments in their road infrastructure and new Chinese rail wagons are increasing the capacity and efficiency of their rail sector. So when you put investments like that together and you start comparing costs of production in Australia versus our competitors, the picture that emerges, unfortunately, for Australia is that if you compare Russia and Australia, our supply chain costs, so this is the cost of getting grain from farm onto a ship, is often over $80 a tonne. It's far less in Russia. Uh, similarly, the production costs are far less. In Australia, maybe $148 a tonne. Uh, production costs in Russia, $120 a tonne. And I can tell you that last year, Lawrence Richmond's costs of production in southern Ukraine were far below $120 a tonne. That's for wheat. Similarly, uh, Argentina and Australia. Australia is a more expensive source of wheat with respect to farm costs of production and supply chain costs. Now, having said that, and that, that's a very sobering picture, and the ramification of that is that Australia's market share and grain destinations are being squeezed. Australian wheat, for example, that used to go to the Middle East goes there far less often. Those markets are being lost mostly to Black Sea grain. Most Australian grain uh, wheat, I'm talking about, goes to Indonesia. Indonesia is by far Australia's main destination for exported wheat. And it's no surprise that Indonesia is on our doorstep. In a few years, fortunately for us, Indonesia is going to replace Egypt as the world's largest importer of wheat. We are very fortunate to have that volume of demand on our doorstep because, as I said, our supply chain costs are not something that gives a great reach for Australian wheat. In spite of that, our wheat production has increased. Our farming systems have become more crop dominant. In South Australia, your sheep population has declined from 17 million down to around about 11 million. So we are running farming systems that are very grain exposed. And yet those very grains on which the businesses rely are being subject 
to intense overseas competition. You might say I've just done the usual black-hatted economist view of ringing the warning bell, but the practical issue at both the farm and the industry level is, okay, the competition has arisen over the last decade or so, what do we do about it? So a few suggestions is firstly, don't put your head in the sand, understand what is the nature of your competition. Because if you thoroughly understand it, then you know what strategies and tactics to put in place to respond to that competition. One of the issues that people are not aware of is that although we are facing direct competition in some of our markets, so there is Argentinian grain going into Indonesia, Argentina has already sold, exported most of its 2018 harvest, so there's, there's no more grain coming out of Argentina into Indonesia because they've already fought, sold. But what we are also going to experience is indirect competition. So you're going to have Black Sea Argentinian wheat displacing not only Australian wheat, but USA wheat and Canadian wheat. And that displaced Canadian and US wheat is going to have to find a home somewhere. So we, we are going to experience both direct and indirect competition. The, the other thing that's going to happen is that we are going to experience competition not only from the volume of grain production, but also from grain organisation. So we, we are going to experience organisational competition. So you're going to have the US Wheat Associates, you're going to have SIGI, that's the Canadian International Grains Institute, uh, Cereals Canada. You're going to have France's um, Cereal Export. You're going to have these organisations that are committed to advancing the cause of grains in those respective countries, working at trying to enhance the marketing and appreciation of grains from those respective countries. The issue for me is that following the demise of the Australian Wheat Board, we now have a plethora of grain industry associations and several of those are insecurely funded. They are not always well coordinated and it seems to me at an industry level we can improve in that area. We should be making sure that our grains organisations are well coordinated and effective. They should be held to account wherever they rely on grower funds. Growers should be receiving a benefit from the funds they invest in these sorts of organisations and, and where the organisations need to be amalgamated to deliver cost efficiencies, I think they should be. The other strategy which is a farm level strategy is to make sure that you produce your grain as cheaply as possible. Now unfortunately in this last year, the unit cost of production was exceedingly high because your yields were so low. If you translate all your fixed and variable costs into your true cost of production, last year was a terrible year. Your grain at the farm gate was just very expensive. Now, fortunately, there was a lot of domestic demand because of the drought that helped relieve that cost pressure. And farmers who had average yields probably, in a financial sense, had a, a very good year because of the unusually high grain prices. But I think the strategic future for Australian grains is delivering, yes, high yielding varieties, but also growing varieties that attract price premium because Australia will never be able to be a low cost source of feed grains. 
on the international market. We are, our labour is too expensive, our soils are too infertile, our supply chain costs are too expensive to be a preferred source of low cost feed grain. And of course the other issue is to, wherever possible, and I know this is risky, but play the, the season. Cut your costs in the poor years, chase upside if you've got the appetite for risk and, and the capital backing to do so. The other thing that gives Australia a comparative advantage is our crop breeding organisations. Australia is globally unique with its endpoint royalty system so that our crop breeding companies are some of the best globally and because of their proficiency, they're able to very rapidly deliver high yielding, fit for purpose varieties. So grain quality can be a marketing strategy to underpin Australia's market share. And I think that's something that the Australian industry needs to maintain and trade on, being flexible, being skillful, The other thing is to diversify your crop and enterprise portfolios. And again, I think this is sensible risk management strategies. Mixed enterprise farming systems have served the Australian grains industry very well for decades and decades. And I think that's a sensible business strategy. I often ask farmers, what is the Black Sea equivalent for sheep production. It used to be New Zealand, but I think the answer is now there is none. There is no Black Sea equivalent for Australia's sheep industry. And that, I think, is the germ of an idea on which farm businesses can maintain their resilience through diversification. The last point is to just know and manage your supply chains. A lot of farmers don't realise, but 30% of the FOB price of grain is in supply chain costs. Every dollar that is stripped out of the supply chain is a dollar that's available to bid up the price at the farm gate. So maintaining pressure on grain handlers, always looking for efficiencies for co-investment to drive efficiencies in your supply chain is an activity from which farmers at an individual and at an industry level can benefit. Much of the research is within the farm gate and yet there are significant benefits still to be captured within the supply chain. So here's my summary. I'm saying that low cost nations are increasingly proficient in exporting grain and that is restricting the reach and market share of Australian grain. That is not going to change in a hurry. And so the issue is what does the Australian grains industry and what do farmers individually do about that when their core business is growing and exporting grain? And I'm suggesting that Australian farmers and their industry have a few options that are worth pursuing because in pursuing those, you're only going to add to the resilience and the profitability of not only your farm but the industry as a whole. So a somewhat sobering message, but I think it is what it is.